ahead and take your Bibles this morning. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. I really like this story here in the Bible. This is a great story we're going to look at about David. And I want to show you some things uh, before I kind of get into the main part of the message. Kind of have a longer introduction. And then uh, the message is just kind of more at the end. But we're going to look at a story here of David... And I believe in this, in this story here, we see a great example of why David was called a man after God's own heart. And whenever you say someone's a man after your own heart, it means, you know, you're saying we've got a lot in common. And that's, that, you know, that's usually a good compliment when somebody, when somebody says that. And God said that about David. He was a man after his own heart. And it's something that we see in David here, I just admire in him in such a great way. And as we kind of look at some of these things closely here, I want to show you some comparisons of with David and Jesus, and then uh, a great lesson here on something that we all need to learn in our own lives. But look at verse five of Second Samuel chapter sixteen, and look what it says. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, he, uh, he came forth and cursed still as he came. Now, a little bit of background, what's going on here. David is now on the run from his own son. Absalom is trying to overthrow the kingdom. David is at a very low point in his life here. Here, here he is, he's on the run from his own son. And here comes this man from the family of Saul and he sees David and he starts cursing him. Verse six. And it says, and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of the king and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, come out, come out thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. I kind of like that guy's attitude right there. Who's this guy messing with my king? Talking about my king like that. He's a dead dog. Lord... Or, you know, king, let me go take off his head. And you know what? We're going to see here in a little bit. This guy could have done it real easy. It says that David's mighty men were with him. We don't have time to read about David's mighty men, but these men did some incredible things physically. These men were incredible warriors like none that we've ever seen. I mean, these guys were warriors like from some action movie or something. And this one in particular, we're going to look at something that he did in just a little bit. But here comes this nobody along and he's cursing David and he's cursing his servants. He's throwing stones at him while David is surrounded by his mighty men. And, the, and David, he's just standing there and he's taking it. Abishai is standing there and he's like, you know, why are we letting this happen? Let me go take his head off. And he would have done it in a heartbeat. All David would have had to do is just give him a little nod and that man is so dead, it's not even funny. And so, look at what it says in verse 10. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth from my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Uh, and Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel was with them. So right there, we, we're going to stop reading there. But Ahithophel was another one of David's loyal counselors. And they are, they're going after David and just everybody's turning on David. David is on the run from his son. 
He is at a low point, and then here comes this nobody along, just cursing him, throwing stones at him, humiliating him. And this man, I mean, what he was doing right there, it was basically, he's basically committing suicide. You don't go mess with the king like that when he is surrounded by his most loyal, mighty men. You might remember one story, some of these mighty men that were there with David. One time, David wanted a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem when they were hiding in the cave. And what did he, they, those guys do? Man, they went and defeated practically a whole army to get a cup of water for their king. I mean, they, 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 would, they would have killed that guy so fast. And this guy had to know what he was doing. This guy had to know this is going to get me killed. But you know what? He hated David so much. He didn't care. He went and just cursed him. And I believe this story right here is a great example of why David is considered a man after God's own heart. David in the story, he's at a low point. His son's leading a rebellion against him. He's on the run. Some of his closest friends are turning on him. Just one thing after another, this guy from the family of Saul comes along, takes advantage of David's low point in his situation. He's cursing him. This man's basically committing suicide. Look, turn over to 2 Samuel chapter uh, 23. Okay, so there in verse 9, we see Abishai. He's asking permission. Can I go take off his head? And he, that guy wouldn't have stood a chance against him. Look at this guy who wanted to cut his head off. Look at what he did one time. And Ab verse 18, And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief among three, and he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had a name among the three. Was he not more honorable of three? Therefore, he was their captain, howbeit he attained not to the first three. This guy one time took care of 300 people with a spear. So just, you know, keep that in mind. This is the guy standing next to David. David, he's not intimidated by this man cursing him one bit. N not one bit is he intimidated, yet he lets this man go on and curse. And he's doing it just thinking, you know what? Maybe if I allow this, God will see the affliction that's on me and God will show me mercy. That was his David showed unbelievable self-control in this situation you know self-control i can't think of another example of somebody showing this kind of self-control other than jesus christ himself when he was on the cross think about jesus when he was on the cross what happened to him when he was on the cross we're not going to read the story of the crucifixion but he was he not spit on was he not cursed was he not mocked was any of that just Absolutely not. None of it was just. And we're not going to take time to go back and read it. But if you go, well, well go, let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 26. Because I just, I want to show you this because I think this is a great picture. The story of David, of Jesus when he's being mocked on the cross. Because once again, David is standing there with his mighty men ready to go. Ready to defeat his enemy at just the slightest nod that man is dead me and he's done cursing. And anybody else who would want to curse David is going to look at that man and say, you know what, I'm not going to curse David. But look at what it says in Matthew 26. After the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, verse 52, then said Jesus, you, know, Pete, you remember uh, Peter, he tried taking out one of the guys, cut off the guy's ear. Then said Jesus unto him, put up thy sword into his place for all that they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? You all see that? Jesus, at any time, could have prayed to the father 12 legions of angels. Now, we see stories of one angel killing thousands of people. 12 legions of of angels at any moment jesus could have come while those people are all mocking him spitting on him while he is hanging on that cross at any point he could have prayed to the father and they are all dead but you understand had he done that we'd all be in trouble too wouldn't we thank god he finished that work on the cross thank god he paid for our sins there on that cross but he could have stopped it at any time, and he didn't do it. He did it because of his love for us. He did it in obedience to the Father. And the, the self, there, there's never been self-control 
like that. But I think we see what David went through on a small scale, similar to what Jesus did. David could have stopped at any moment. David, though, he didn't give in to his emotions. He didn't try to find a way to justify it. You know what he did? He let that man curse. He took the humiliation. He took the abuse. Probably got hit by some of the stones that were thrown his way. He did that just showing self-control in, in a great way. And I do. I, I, I admire that kind of thing. I, I, I like a person that's got some self-control. That's something that we all need to have in our life. And I do. I believe that that was one of the reasons David was considered a man after God's own heart. The unbelievable self-control he had. But understand, though, we live in a world today where people's actions, where people's emotions are literally at the mercy of everyone around them. They let everyone control. Them. They have no self-control. They have no idea how to function in society. They're set off by every little thing that comes their way. They've tried every medication. They've read all the self-help books. You know, they've watched the programs for how they can control themselves. And, you know, finally, they become prisoner to live with the symptoms of a diagnosis that some psychiatrist gave them. You know what? You've got this. Therefore, you react this way in these situations. And it's like they don't even try to control themselves anymore. Some of you might remember. I know Brother Lonnie will remember him because he gave him a ride that we had the guy come to church here one time. He was wearing the insane clown posse T-shirt. You know, he, he knew I was talking about as soon as that. And th this guy, you know, he was like in his 20s, you know, lived with his mom, was on every medication in the world, and he had some serious issues, okay? You know, he got up, he had to go, he had to leave service about three times, go take a smoke break about every 10 minutes during the message. Uh, his mom went out, took one with him. It, it was, it was bad. Uh, after the service, boy, they just loved it. Uh, they thought this church was great. And... Uh, I wanted me to come by and visit with them, talk about joining the church. And so uh, I said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll come by this week and, and we'll have a conversation. Well, well, he called me that week. I was going to go over there like on a Tuesday or something. I was going to take Brother Lonnie with me because I was kind of scared to go over there by myself. Uh, but he had called me earlier in the week and just needed to talk. And he started telling me about, I, I forgot what he'd been diagnosed with, but he had a whole bunch of stuff. And he started telling me about, and Brother Lonnie had already kind of warned me because he told Brother Lonnie some stuff that was pretty scary, all right? And um, he started telling me about his anger issues that he has and how he's got this problem. And so, you know, he, he gets in fights with people a lot. And so if he gets in fights with anybody at the church, you know, we need to understand that it's not his fault and God understands. And I told him, I said, listen, I said, you can't get in fights with people at the church. And he's like, well, I can't help it. I, I have this. I said, I understand if you have that, but listen, you can't fight with people at church. I said, nobody in this church is going to do anything to you that's going to cause them to deserve you to fight with them. So it's like, you, you can't fight with people. He's like, but no, but you don't understand. I can't control these things. I have this. And sometimes people, they just make me angry and I can't help it. And... He was, you know, and so I'm like, I said, listen, I said, you know, this is a concern. I said, you know, we have kids in the church. And he told me one of the things he said, he said, I never feel suicidal, but sometimes I feel homicidal. Okay. Now, just so y'all can feel comforted, if somebody tells us they have homicidal tendencies, um, you know, we're not going to let them come here to church. Okay. We don't want anybody getting murdered here. And, you know, but yeah, he told, he told, I feel homicidal sometimes. Not suicidal, like I should be comforted by that. You know, I was like, no, listen, I don't want people to feel suicidal, but I would rather that than homicidal because I don't want to be the victim. You know, and, he, and, I, and if he feels that way, he can't help it because he's got this and this and this and this. And he's telling me all these things. And I, you know, I said, listen, I said, we've got kids at the church. It's like, you know, have you ever had trouble? You know, oh, no, no, I, I, I never want to do anything to kids, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, I was like, well, listen, I said, I'm going to be coming over tomorrow. Uh, so me and Brother Lonnie, we're going to come by. We'll talk to you about this stuff. But I was like, you know, I said, I said, you can't. I said, if you come to church, you, you're not allowed to fight with anybody. <laughs> I was like, I said, you can't take smoke breaks during service. <laughs> I was like, it's like, if you got some smoking to do, you got to do it before you get here and wait till after you leave. And you know, I, I, I'm kind of laying out these rules. Well, his mom called me up a little while later and she chewed me out because how dare I think he would do anything to children? 
And I said, well, I wasn't accusing him. I'm just asking, do I need to be concerned? He told me he has homicidal tendencies, you know? And, you know, and, I, and, you know, we're going back. And she's like, he can't help these things, you know, blah, blah, blah. He has this. He has that. And it was like this guy was just completely resigned to the fact that, you know what? I have these things. Therefore, it's not my problem. And what was funny, like the day before that, or the reason he originally called me, or his mom had called me the day before that, because this was before she got mad at me because he had just gotten in trouble with the police because he had to go to court for something. And somebody there at the courthouse told him something he didn't like, and he started spazzing out, and they had to have an ambulance come take him away. And, and, and I did. I told the mom, I said, you know, I said, you just told me how at a courthouse he completely lost it, and an ambulance had to come. I said, listen, we, I don't want to be calling an ambulance out to the church because your son's behavior is out of control. And boy, you know, she did. She told me off. We're not compassionate. We're not a good church. You know, and she, she had all kinds of terrible things to say. But listen, you have to control yourself, folks. All right. You know, we've all got issues. We've all got our things that set us off. You know what? Two days in a row, I went to McDonald's and they put cheese on my stuff. Two days in a row. And you know what? I was nice. I didn't, I didn't do anything. I had to control it. Now, you know how much that stuff sets me off. You know how much that stuff aggravates me but you know what i don't get to beat up the drive-thru workers even though i feel it i don't get to do it i've never done it listen when i was in in peru okay their mcdonald's was 10 times worse when i lived in peru they messed my stuff up all the time and i was always complaining about it at church there too and one day man they did they did it again they put cheese on my sandwich and so I did. I went walking in. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to tell him something this time. I, I've got something. That I, I'm, I'm going to tell him. Off. And as I go walking in, two ladies from the church are standing right there. And so I, and, and they saw the look on my face. And it, it was so funny because the lady from the church, she saw me and she saw the look on my face. She saw me with a bag of food and she was just like, they put cheese on, their, on your sandwich, didn't they? <laughs> and I just said, Yep. And then the McDonald's worker that was there, she saw that and she was just like, does this happen a lot? And I said, yes. <laughs> and that was all I said. And it was funny. A few days later, I was back there. I don't know why I keep going to McDonald's. But a few days later, I never learned my lesson. A few days later, I went back there and I had Tommy and Jason with me. And Tommy, something's wrong with him. He got dropped in his head and he was little. And he likes cheese on his sandwich. And so, you know, I ordered a, che- a double cheeseburger or something like that. And it was funny because then that worker, and she wasn't even the one that took my order, she like checked the order and she saw the one had cheese on it. And I saw her go to the worker like, this is supposed to have cheese on it. And so the lady did another one and it actually was supposed to have cheese. But I saw her do that and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to say anything. And so I gave it to Tommy. I was like, it doesn't have cheese on it, eat it anyway. But, you know, the, you know, we all have those things that set us off, don't we? But, you know, we have to control those things. You know, one of my ways to vent, I like to tell it all, you know, tell these stories and then my ser- good sermon illustrations. But, you know, you do. They, it, it's, it's frustrating. We all have stuff and we have to learn to control ourselves. And let, I, I've made the mistake many times of trying to tell someone who's been diagnosed with something that they have a self-control problem or a spiritual problem only to cause them to display all the side effects of their issues. Okay. When you say that, it's going to be bad. But listen, the problems that we have today, we've always had. Them. It's just we've invented new names for them. And I'm not saying there aren't chemical things that affect us. I'm not saying, listen, if you've got a physical problem, if you've got a pain, pain causes us to get grumpy, doesn't it? If you're hungry, it'll cause you to get grumpy. If you're tired, if you're behind in your sleep, if you're stressed out, there are many things that cause bad behavior in us, no, uh, aren't there? And we do. We all have our things that set us off that we've got to watch. But you all understand the rules don't change depending on what you're going through. And they, but they do. They'll display whatever side, effect, side effects some doctor told them you're probably going to have. And, and, and I said, if, if you've been diagnosed with something, I'm not picking on you. All right? I don't know, you know. I'm sure if I went and saw enough doctors, I've probably got a few, you know, things. I've probably got some stuff that I could claim victim status for, you know. I don't think I have anything good enough where I can collect disability or anything like that. So I I haven't worried about going to a doctor for anything. But I'm not saying none of them are real. I'm not saying they're not legitimate. But listen, it is important. We have got to learn how to 
get control over our own spirit, how to have some self-control. And, you know, in this message, you know, if, if, so if you've just fallen victim to whatever you've got and you are living in a prison where you are forced to carry out the side effects of everything a doctor told you you've got, you know, this isn't for you. But if you'd like to actually have victory, you know, if you'd like to have freedom, you know, then this, this message is for you. And so, you know, what can a person do to have victory in their life over these things? Well, turn over to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. This is a great verse. You ought to underline this one. I think it would be a good one to have memorized. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. It says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You all see that? If you can't rule over your spirit, if you can't rule over it, you're like a city. Broken down, no walls. What does that mean? Well, it means there's nothing stopping the enemy from coming in and having its way. And if you don't have any rule over your spirit, it is going to be easy for people to just set you off. And listen, I hate to admit anything like this, but you know, when I was in school, you know, there were always, there was some of those kids who had the explosive temper. And when somebody has an explosive temper, listen, we all love explosions, don't we? We like to watch explosions. It's a lot of fun to see. And when somebody has an explosive temper, it's fun to just light the fuse sometimes and watch them lose it and get themselves in trouble. And I'm not, I'm not going to say I never did anything. I I wasn't usually the one that would set these people off. I I had too much conscience for that. I was too nice. I would get other people to do things to get them. And and then I'd watch the whole show and I could sit back and claim innocence. All right. I, I, you know, Shouldn't have done that stuff, but it happened, and it was it was funny, and it it, it you enjoyed what I you know I said I got in so much trouble growing up. I always took great pleasure in seeing other people get into trouble. It was it was entertaining, but you understand these people because they had no control over their spirit. It made it easy for somebody like me to come in and manipulate and get them in trouble. But you know there was other people in the school that I could do those same things to them, but there was. No response. There was no reaction. They controlled themselves. Therefore, it wasn't worth my time. I've worked with people like that. You know, I've, I've, I've worked a lot of years in factories and the distribution centers and stuff. And you always have those people that do. They have that explosive temper. And people do. And, and when I was in Spring Valley out there, it was like a little village out there. We didn't work real hard. A lot of people and people get, would get bored. And there, were, there was these one group of guys. It was like their entertainment was watching other people lose their temper. And so they would, man, they would do things to set people off. There was one guy in particular that they were always messing with because he did, he had such a temper and it was just, it was entertaining. You know, they got bored unloading boxes all day. So what would they do? They would, they would mess with this guy so they could see what he would do. And it would all, it would always ended up making a great show. And it it had some entertainment value. But you know what? They messed with him because he had no rule over his own spirit. He was like that city broken down with no walls. But, you know, there was plenty of other people that they could have messed with, but they didn't because it just wasn't worth the time. It wasn't worth the trouble. These people had control over their own spirit, and therefore they weren't even going to mess with them. And listen, if you're you're an invading army and you're wanting to attack a city and get the spoils of that city... You know, you're going to go after the easier ones first. You're going to go after the ones that don't have walls, not ones who have big, strong walls built up around. You're going to go after the ones that don't have them. And if you're somebody that can't control yourself, you have no self-control, then people are going to take advantage of you. The devil's going to take advantage of you. And it's like these people, too, that have these issues, they're always talking about everyone else. Well, it's everyone else's fault. It's not my fault. Well, listen, bub, I'm sorry, but there's billions of people on this world. And you know what? They've all got their own personalities. They've all got their own things that they want to do. And you just got to learn to deal with people. And if you don't like it, you know, go move out in the middle of the wilderness somewhere all by yourself. Me, me and the boys, we went and spent Monday and Tuesday in Chicago. And man, one thing I kept complaining about was how many people were in that city. It's like, good night. Just so many people. And I was just, you know, Made me thankful for where we live. You know, 25,000 Sterling and Rock Falls. 
That's not bad. I like, I like that. I don't want to live in a city with millions of people. It's just, it's crazy. I don't know if it's millions, but it seemed like millions when we were there. And, but you know what? We live in a world with a lot of people and not everybody plays by our rules and not everybody's like us. They're going to be, have different personalities. There's going to be people that are annoying. People are going to get in your way when you go out there and you have to sit, you know, We've got to have traffic lights and stop signs and things like that because there's a lot of people trying to get around and we just got to deal with that. And if you can't handle that, that's your problem. Most people in the world are handling it just fine. They can deal with it, but many people are. They're that broken down city and there, there, are, there are some things that no one can do for you. No one else can control your spirit. No one else can control your emotions for you. Just like no one can call on the name of the Lord for you. Nobody can have a prayer life for you. Nobody can have a relationship with God for you. I can't read the Bible for you. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody could do all these things for us? Wouldn't it be nice if someone could exercise for us? Just say, you know what? I'm out of shape. I need to run, but I don't feel like it. You know, you go run for me. It's not how it works, is it? No, you have to actually do it yourself. You can't just watch an exercise video and watch them exercise. You've got to do the things yourself too, don't you? But unfortunately, people, they don't want to do anything. And you know what? Nobody can get control over your spirit. It's going to take work. It's going to take exercise. You're going to have to strengthen yourself. And only you can do that. And if you're one of these people that just, you sit around, you complain about everyone else all the time. I'm miserable because of this person or that person. Listen, that is, it's not their fault. It's your fault. No, it's my husband's fault. Or it's, it's my wife's fault. No, listen, you, you've got to learn how to deal with each other. You're going to have to learn how to put up with some stuff. You're going to have to deal with some things that aren't pleasant. They are, uh, you know, people aren't just robots that we can program to do whatever we want. People are going to do things we don't like that are going to bother us. And we've just got to deal with it. And so, you know, thank you. Know, and so just like no one can exercise for you, you know, you can have people that can be there to motivate you, cheer you on, but you, you can't be dependent on them. They're not always going to be there. There's going to be times where stuff's going to come your way and set you off and they're not going to be there. You've got to be able to handle it yourself. You know, if you, and if you have a bad spirit, it's because you have a problem, not everybody else. And you do, you go find that person that's got a bad attitude all the time. Hey, what's your problem? They never say, well, I've got anger problems. I've got this. I've got that. You know, what do they do? They start talking about everybody else. Listen, how is it? that you can have one person in the neighborhood that lives in the same neighborhood you do, and they hate everyone. Everyone's making them miserable. Everyone drives them nuts, but then you have someone else who lives in that same neighborhood, and they're just fine. What's the difference? It's the difference one's got control of the spirit, and another one doesn't. They're the problem. If you're the one who hates everybody, if you're the one that's miserable, if you're the one who everyone else is driving you nuts, it's because you have the problem. You don't have control over your own spirit. You're letting everyone else control you. Well, they should leave me alone. They shouldn't bother me. Well, you know what? You know, we have to exist. We can't all go leave and hide in the woods somewhere. You know, we, we have to, you know, we're going to interact. Most, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times annoying people, they're not, not annoying because they're trying to be annoying. It's just, that's just their personality. They're annoying. And you know what? We can't just make everybody go get a personality transplant just to make you happy. It's, it's, it's not possible. But it's like, that's what people expect. They'll quit coming to church. Well, this person bothers me. I don't like, you know, this person's annoying. I don't like how they sing. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't like what this person does in service. You know what? Get over it. Understand that, you know, I think some people would be happy if there was only two people in the church, them and the pastor. And then they would probably complain about the pastor if the preaching wasn't good enough. And they are, they're, they're that miserable. If you're like that, it's, it's you that's a problem. It's up to you to be diligent and to keep the walls built up and in good condition. And so, you know, your temper, anger, emotions, they're yours to deal with. And only you can control how you respond. Proverbs 16 and verse 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than one that taketh the city. So if you don't have control over your spirit, you're weak. You're that city without walls that anyone could come along and they're going to they're gonna 
decide what your emotions are. They're going to decide what your mood is. But if you're somebody who has control of your spirit, not only do you have that strong defense, but you're like one who takes the city. You're the one, you're, you not only have a strong defense, but you have a strong offense too. Because you can, you can control your spirit, you can control your temper, and we've got to work on those things. We've got to get control. These are ours. This is my spirit. I can only control my spirit. You can only control your spirit and your actions. You can't control what everyone else does. Everybody else is going to continue doing what everybody else does. When I leave here today, well, I get impatient sometimes when I'm behind the wheel of a car. While I'm impatient, you know what? I'm going to have, I have to deal with the fact that I'm going to have to stop at stop signs and let other people go first and stop at red lights and wait for other people to go. I'm going to have to, I might even have to stop at a red light and nobody's even coming from the other directions. I should just be able to run the red light in that situation, right? But no, that's just not how things work in society. We got to play by certain rules. We got to be careful. We all got to do that stuff. I don't like it, but you know what? I'm going to have to deal with it. Even if that bothers me, and even if I'm annoyed, annoyed by that, that's, I, I've, got to be, I've got to be stronger than they are. If you all are annoying, okay, I can't let that control. I've, I've got to be stronger than you. I've got, to be, I've got to be able to deal with that. I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm not going to let that get to me. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to enjoy my life. And I'm not going to let the fact that somebody, I don't like the way they pick their nose or I don't like the way they comb their hair or I don't like the way they dress. I'm not going to let those things bother me and put me in a bad mood and make it where I can't even enjoy church because I just don't like somebody's little quirk that they've got. You know how, you know how much joy people miss out on because of just little things like that? Little stuff like that that just bothers them and gets to them. And they won't do the things that they should be doing. They won't enjoy the things that they should be enjoying just because of some little thing like that. You know how ridiculous that is? We've, you need to get over If that's you, you need to get over those things. And only you can do that. And if you do, if you have a sin problem, turn over to James chapter 1. I preached a message on this a while back. I'm not going to preach this whole message again, but I, this, this is worth repeating. James chapter 1 and verse 12. One thing that people do, this guy too that was that visited the church and wanted us to deal with all his issues, wanted us to, you know, put up with him fighting with people in the church. You know, wanted us to take a chance on his homicidal tendencies that he has. This guy that did that, he kept saying, God understands. God knows. God understands. He he kept he kept saying that. And what people do when they have these issues, and we all have our issues, folks, all right? Just admit it. We all have our issues. What do they do? They blame God for it. This is how God made me. I've got this problem. Therefore, I have this side effect. God did this to me. So my sin that I commit as a result of whatever I've got, it's not my fault. It's God's fault. God understands. I under, you know, it's like God's in heaven. I know I really messed up when I made you. I gave you that chemical imbalance. And so, you know what? All those laws I gave in the Bible about, you know, and all those things I said about self-control, about you know, not killing people and things like that. You know, I'm going to give you an exception since I messed up so bad with your chemical imbalance that you have. Now, that's ridiculous. And listen to what the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Endureth temptation. Endureth it. What does that mean? It means we're being tempted. We want to do something that we shouldn't do. And the Bible says you're blessed when you endure it, when you put up with it. You don't give in to it. You don't do what you want to do, what you are inclined to do. We all have different temptations. But we're blessed when we endure it. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When you are tempted to do something wrong, when you feel like doing something that you shouldn't do, it is because of your own lust. You, we all, and we all have different lusts. We all have different things that we struggle with. But you all understand that that temptation that we have, the Bible says don't blame God for that. That's not because of God. No, that's because of your own lust. And every man is tempted 
when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, you thought you doing what you felt like doing would make you happy. You thought strangling that person to death would give you a moment of happiness. But you know what? You got enticed. It didn't work. You thought punching that person in the nose, that would make your, that would make your day. But you know what? You got enticed because you got drawn away of your own lust. And guess what? We don't get to blame God for that. Don't say that. No, this is, this is your problem. You've got a sin problem. You've got a lust problem. These temptations you have, they are yours. And the Bible says, blessed is the man that endures. Blessed, you're going to receive blessing, but you're also going to be happy. It means to be happy. And these people, too, that have allowed themselves to be prisoner to all the side effects of the diagnosis some psychiatrist gave them, these people are always miserable. You know why? Because they don't endure temptation. They give in to temptation. You know, all here comes that anger again. Well, it's because I've got this, you know, I've got this problem. And what do they do? They just, you know, start beating somebody down or whatever, giving into that temptation. And it doesn't make them happy. Listen, you know, be honest. You know, don't, don't raise your hand. But just be honest with yourself. You've all been there before and you did. You told somebody off like you wanted to tell them off and it felt good at that moment. But later it didn't feel so good, did it? You know Why? Why did you do it? You know, I always feel bad after I do these things. It's because you got drawn away of your own lust and enticed. You were tricked. You were deceived. And that's what our, our emotions, our anger, our issues, whatever, that's what it does. And so we have to control them. We have to submit ourselves to the law of God and say, as much as I want to do this right now, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take responsibility for my sin. This is my sin problem. This is my issue. I'm going to take responsibility for it and I'm going to get control over it. I'm not going to blame other people for my problems. I'm going to deal with it. And listen, so when you sin, it's because you were, you were drawn away of your own lust and enticed. And look, God, you know, we need to understand when it comes to our sins, when it comes to the things going on, God's not going to let the world get away with this wicked, the wicked that's going on. And, I, and listen, sometimes th- people are going to do things that are legitimately wrong, things that they shouldn't do. And it's hard sometimes to watch people sin and it seems like nothing happens to them. But listen, that's where self-control comes in. Okay, let's go back to that story of David. All right, here comes that man. He comes along and what is he doing? He's cursing David. David doesn't deserve this. He's cursing David. David exercises self-control like never before. That man finally gets tired of throwing rocks and cursing. And he goes on his way. And you know what he does? That man does. He lives a normal life. Nothing. David didn't do anything. He let him get away with it. Temporarily. And it's the same thing too. All those people, all these people out in the world today who reject Christ. All these atheists out there that, who just blaspheme. All these false religions out there saying the things that they do about our Savior. Does it not appear like they're getting away with it? Those people who mock Jesus on the cross. Those people who spit on him. Those people who, you know, say he saved others. Let him save himself. They got away with it then. But ultimately, did they get away with it? Now, listen, we know that a day is coming where Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth, isn't he? And at that, and at that time when he comes back, there's going to be a battle that we call the battle of Armageddon, where he is going to defeat the armies of the world with the word of his mouth. Out of his mouth is going to come a sharp two-edged sword. Blood will flow that day from Jesus Christ. There's going to be a great white throne of judgment one of these days. Where people are going to stand before and they are going to be cast for all eternity into the lake of fire, which is the second death. God is not going to let people get away with the sins that they are doing. But in the meantime, is God not showing self-control? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I look at what goes on in America. I'm like, why isn't God destroying America right now? Why aren't, why aren't, you know, why, you look at California. They're always talking about that earthquake that's going to come one of these days. And most of California is going to fall into the ocean. And you see all the wickedness that goes on. It's like, why hasn't that happened yet? 
You know why? Because our God has a lot of self-control. But understand that one of these days, though, he's going to, in his time, he's going to say enough's enough, and these things are going to happen. And David, while David showed self-control like we've never seen before, do you all realize all, that man did not get away with what he had done that day? Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 2, or 1 Kings chapter 2, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 2. David, this is years later, he's about ready to die. His uh, Solomon is going to be the next king. David on his deathbed, he's kind of giving some final instructions. Listen to what he says in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 8. And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, of Benjamin, of Bahurim, which cursed me with the grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim, but he came down to meet me at Jordan. I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now, therefore, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his whorehead bring thou down to the grave with blood. Do you all see that? David said, I made him a promise that day that I wouldn't kill him as long as I live. But I'm going to die real soon. And when I do take care of business with that guy. And that is exactly what happened. He took care of that guy. He killed that guy. David, uh, you would think he'd be like, you know what? I'm about to die. I would like one final pleasure. That guy that got me, I know I made a promise, but you know what? I don't need to worry about feeling bad about it. I'm going to be dead here in a few days. So I want to watch that guy get what's coming to him. You know what he did? Even before he died, you know, he waited. When I'm dead, because I made a promise, then take care of him. When the time is right. And that's exactly what he did. That guy deserved to die. That guy, that guy should, you know, David should have let Abishai just take off his head. That guy, he would have been dead before his body hit the ground. But he didn't. Self-control. And understand that's how God is. God sees what's going on. But there is an appointed time and he's going to wait until then. And listen, Jesus Christ, he left us an example. We should follow his steps. If he could have self-control, if guys like David could have self-control, we will never face anything like they did. We will never face anything like Jesus Christ did. Yet he had self-control. Then you know what? We, we need to have self-control. We need to get victory over ourself. We need to understand that we are our own worst enemy. We get ourselves in more trouble than anyone else. No, it's other people. No, no, no. We let those people get us in trouble. We need to have those walls built up. And if you don't have them, that's your fault. That's your problem. You need to do that. You need to get victory over yourself and learn from the examples of men like David and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with that, let's all stand.